Hello everybody and welcome or welcome back to the second shelf. See what I did here? I amended my first sentence a little bit. Welcome or welcome back. Yes, it's a new year. Everything is new. <laughs> but what is not new is the recent reads on Sunday, in which I discuss the books that I've finished or started or am still working on. And the first section, as it were, is the books that I've finished. I've finished two. Um... This one, I didn't finish this book. I just finished uh, the first uh, Malafrena, which is a, a novel by Le Guin, published in, uh, in 1979, even though it was actually the first novel that she worked on. And in the, the original... Um, uh, the, the original of this novel uh, was rejected by... Uh, quite some publishers. And then uh, Le Guin worked on it um, f for more than 10 years, off and on, and finally it was published in 1979 when she was already an established sci-fi writer. And why am I telling you this? Because Malafrena is not a sci-fi novel. It's a mixture of historical novel, but set in a made-up country. So this, uh, the, the historical time period uh, is the roughly... 1815, 1820, after uh, the, the the war uh, uh, with Napoleon. Napoleon is, has been, um, uh, you know, sent off to, <laughs> to exile. Um, and Europe is uh, divided. Uh, you have Austrian, the Austrian Empire. That part is worked into the book um, as historical facts. But the country uh, that Le Guin set her uh, story in, Orsinia, is a, of course a made-up country. The country is ruled uh, by Austria, by the Austrian emperor. Um, the king of Orsinia has been uh, sent to exile and there is revolution in the air, so to speak. Um, the main main yeah, main male protagonist, um, Itali, um, is a young man from uh, a good estate, so to speak, but he goes to the city, to, to, to the capital, in order to um, work on the revolution, mainly by writing. And you have two female uh, main characters, his sister Laura and his... Uh, yeah, youth, friend, not quite love interest, uh, Piera. And then the novel follows these three young people, you know, into from early adulthood, I would say, but late teens uh, into uh, until their mid-twenties. Um, it did not work that well for me, I have to say. Uh, I, I felt... Um, it's a f sort of 350-page novel, and I, I don't know why I said sort of. It's just a about 350-page novel, and I felt uh, that the, the length of the book, it, it was just not, had, it didn't have enough meat for, for a 350-something-odd uh, page book. I read this together with Adam uh, from Memento Mori, and he... He's not as much a plot-oriented reader as I am, but still he had that same feeling that it was just not enough there, there um, for the, this 350 pages. The, the characters were kind of interesting, but more in terms, in abstract terms. Uh, the setting was kind of interesting. The writing was fantastic. So it, yeah, it was not a bad, bad book, and I'm happy to have read it because I want to read all of Le Guin's work. Um, we are making slowly making our uh, way through her work, but as a as an individual uh, novel, it just didn't work that well for me, unfortunately. Um, and the other book that I finished, I had the same, a much shorter book that is. Tokyo Ueno Station by Yu Miri, translated from the Japanese by Morgan Gills. I still haven't checked whether this is the way you pronounce the translator's name. It's G-I-L-E-S. Uh, at some point, I, 
<laughs> I will look that up. But anyway, this is was published in 2014 uh, in Japanese and in 2020 in the du uh, Dutch in the Dutch translation, in the English translation. Uh, Yumiri was born in uh, Japan and she writes in Japanese, but she lives in uh, South Korea. So she is regarded a Korean author. I don't know how that works, but uh, yeah, she writes in, in Jap uh, Japanese, so I would say she is a Japanese author, but what do I know? Um, anyway, this book uh, is set at uh, this station here, Ueno Station in Tokyo, uh, among a group of homeless people. And one of the homeless people is the main protagonist who tells us his story, uh, but we learn early on that he's already dead. He lived with these homeless people, but he has died and is now a ghost. Um, um, uh, the, the main character was born in the 1930s at the same, uh, in the same year or even the same day as the emperor. And the Japanese history between 1930 and the present time is sort of the back drop of what um, this uh, uh, the main character tells us. I think his name is Kan Kazu. Yeah, Kazu. Or Kazu. K I don't know. <sighs> There's a lot I don't know. <laughs> you realize that? Um, and he, he comes from a, a provincial uh, uh, state and uh, very poor and he goes to the big city to work. He is married, has children, but he rarely sees them because he spent all his time working and sending money back. It's quite a, a sad story, but for some reason um, that mixture of the Japanese history and Kazu's history um, together with snippets of just conversations people have uh, who are waiting for the train and Kazu hears, it just didn't, yeah, it didn't come together for me. I mean, I know uh, Mel, <laughs> you asked me in one of the comments, or you, 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 I think you really love that novel. Um, and um Maybe it's because I just don't know enough about um, Japanese history, so that it didn't. It it stayed very abstract for me. But I'm certainly uh, interested in reading more uh, of Yumiri's work. She is. Uh, she was born in nineteen in the nineteen sixties. So I'm uh, guessing there will be more work by her, uh, also uh, available, becoming available in in in, an, in a translation. So th those were the two books uh, that I finished, and just very briefly to mention uh, the books that I'm still working on. Um, this one, the heroine with the one thousand and one faces by Maria Tatar, um, a response to the male hero that we all know from Star Wars or the Odyssey um, and she tries to come up with the history of the the female uh, hero the heroine I haven't made more than two pages progress so yeah I'm still working on that um, the other book I'm uh, still reading and I'm Halfway through is this uh, collection of essays by Rachel Carson, The Sea Around Us, published in 1951. Um, I already, I had started the book and then it became a buddy read uh, with Heidi from My Reading Life, which is lovely uh, because Heidi can explain uh, all the science stuff to me that I have no idea about. It is about the ocean and it's a, a history of the ocean, um, but also... Um, uh, an exploration of the various life forms that you have in the ocean. There's one, um, and also about the geography. So there's one chapter about islands and how they uh, come to be and what kind of life you have on these islands. Um, and it's, yeah, it's fascinating. Um, and it's really poetically written. So it's very engaging and not dry at all. If what I say sounds dry, then that's because I can't really explain it well, because the book is everything but dry. It is at uh, uh, times outdated, obviously, because it's 70 years old. Uh, but it still gives a good historical view about what we knew about the ocean and about the earth back in the 1950s. And some of it is still true, by the way, but 
you know, there at that time, people, for instance, didn't know um, how the moon came to be. And there was a, a, quite a weird theory about a lava that uh, with the tide uh, got so uh, agitated that a uh, the, the big chunk of it flew off into space and formed the moon. So, you know, there, there are a couple of things that are outdated, but it, yeah, I'm, I'm loving it. And I'm also still working uh, on Louise Edrick's uh, latest novel, The Sentence, uh, another buddy read, uh, this time with Terry uh, from uh, Terry Talks Books. And um, you know, if you follow my channel, that this is sort of the the PS uh, to my 2020 author spotlight, where together with Terry, uh, I made my way through all of Louisa Edrick's novels in chronological order. And she published this last year. So this is kind of a, you know, an afterthought. Um, it's set in a, a bookstore and we have Tuki, our main character, who just uh, came out of prison. Um, and it's hilarious, by the way, why she was in, I mean, it's not hilarious that she was in prison, but the reason why uh, that you learn in the first chapter, <laughs> a typical Edric humor. Um, and Tuki after prison starts to work in a bookstore and one of the customers, uh, the regular customer d uh, dies, Flora, and then ha haunts the bookstore as a ghost. Um, yeah, I'm still really enjoying it. It's quite different from a lot of um, Edric's work because it's very uh, set in, in present times, almost present times. So you have mentioning of uh, Corona and COVID, um, which I always find difficult if it's something that we still live in um, because it sort of takes me out of the book for some reason. But I will, um, you know, talk about it more extensively once I've finished it. And I'm either finishing it today or tomorrow. So stay tuned next week. And there are two books that I've started, uh, both of them buddy reads. Yeah, I have a lot of buddy reads again this month, uh, which I don't mind because I love buddy reads. Uh, the first one is a book that I've wanted, meaning to read for a long time, Elizabeth von Einem. It's not vintage von Einem. Her name is Elizabeth von Einem. Uh, Vera, uh, published in 1921. And um, I read a couple of books by Elizabeth von Arnhem, uh, Enchanted April, uh, but also Elizabeth and her German Garden. And I just love her snarky humor. This one is quite dark um, and it's partly autobiographical. Um, um, the, the main male character, Everard, is sort of modeled after um, Elizabeth von Arnhem's second husband, whom she thought was a prick. And Everard is a prick in this book as well. It's about a marriage between Everard, a middle-aged man in his late 40s, and a, quite a young woman, 22, uh, Lucy. Um, and uh, after Lucy's uh, father dies and Everard's wife has just died, these two grieving people f find each other and plot ensues. And it's dark. But I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, I'm reading this, by the way, with Sonia from The Enthusiastic Reader. Uh, if you don't know her channel, please go um, and check her out. She had a quite a, a, a couple of months absence from BookTube, but came back uh, late last year and hopefully is here to stay. And she is a very um, quiet, but also very, uh, yeah, enthusiastic reader, her channel name. She she loves uh, the books that she talks about, most of them. I mean, if they are not good, she will tell you. So yeah, check her out. But we are, we will finish this uh, next week and then you will hear more. And the last one I started is a buddy read with Kathleen from Kathleen Ann, who also came back uh, to uh, booktube uh, beginning of this year i mentioned that in my last video the the nosy tag you know the 26 questions so if you uh, haven't heard of kathleen ann please check her out because uh, i hope again that she is here to stay this time and we're reading uh, non-fiction amia Srinivasan, uh, The Right to Sex, published last year. Uh, Srinivasan is, um, uh, she was born in the 1980s in um, London, or at least in England. She works as a professor uh, at one of the Oxford colleges. And this is a book about sex 
relations, uh, how we look at them uh, from a feminist point of view, because she is a feminist. And you know, if you follow my channel, that Kathleen and I, we read a lot of n feminist nonfiction. And we were really interested, because this is for from our point of view, the younger generation, she's 30, the author is 37, 38, um, looking at uh, topics like uh, should a feminist be against pornography? What is the the power relations in sexual relations? And it's really interesting. I um, we have our next check in today. I still have to read one of the chapters uh, for today. I will do that this afternoon. But if you are interested in one segment, one topic. Uh, within feminism and uh, a quite an unusual point of view, I would say, tackling the difficult questions, um, um, at least from a feminist point of view, the difficult questions, the questions you'd rather, you know, avoid, uh, like, for instance, false rape accusations. Um, then, even though I'm not yet halfway through, but I can certainly uh, recommend uh, her book and I'm very much uh, looking forward to carrying on. So these were my recent reads for this Sunday which is by the way so extremely grey. Uh, yeah it's so uh, horrible. I mean we have had the winter solstice and you I, I'm always really looking forward to the winter solstice because I don't like it when it's getting dark so early in the afternoon. So when we had in December, it's like 4.30, 4.45 that it's getting dark here. And it's now 5.15, which is kind of an improvement, but the days are so gray that you still feel it's never really light. And I'm, ah, I don't like that. Anyway, <laughs> too much information and not even relevant. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to your comments. And yes, some things will never change. I'm behind again, more than a week behind. I will try to catch up uh, uh, this weekend next week um, so that when the next time you see me, I will be caught up. But I'm still looking forward to your comments and I'll see you all soon in the next one.